and welcome to the ESG Fireside Chat series, a series where we shine a spotlight on the latest trends, innovations and requirements in environmental, social and corporate governance for the commercial property industry. My name is Samir Chopra, Head of Pacific Research and ESG in Asia PAC at CBRE, and I'm your host for today's episode. And joining me is CBRE's National Director of ESG, Sufa and Tan. Today, we will be uncovering key ESG considerations for the industrial sector. I'd like to welcome ESR's Head of Asset Management, Robert Ewing. ESR manages industrial and business park real estate through its leading logistics platform. We also have Mark Bolter, Principal of Safe Sustainable Seafood, a consultancy that provides input on topics such as supply chain management, traceability, and responsible sourcing policies. Mark also provides seafood technical support in these areas for Bid Food Australia. Let's start by talking about your customers. Um, Robert, what are ESR's 2025 ESG goals? Uh, firstly, ESR is a relatively new business. So much of what we're trying to do is set ourselves up for success and get that consistency across the group. Uh, we've set out a roadmap that um, places ESG at the heart of ESR. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, enhanced um, uh, building designs, sustainable uh, practices, you know, res responsible investing. What's kind of the value of taking a leadership position? You know, is this something you do that's, you know, a must win, you know, must have to, to win and retain your customers? Um, you know, is, it, is there a revenue case around ESG or do you see it just being, you know, good from an operating cost perspective? I think the answer is the same which way you look at it. Yeah. Um, you know, from, from what we want to do is, you know, talk with our customers, understand what they want, um, implement that into our building design. We want to be more efficient. We want to have sustainable buildings. Yeah. Sustainability, efficiency drives lower operating costs. Yeah. Um, and then in itself, um, it focuses on the customer. We're either attracting customers to our product yeah. or retaining them within our buildings. Mark, I might pull you into this as well. You know, uh, can you you know paint a picture of your customers? You know, the sorts of products that Bid Food is involved in, the supply chain, and sort of how many depots does does Bid Food have? Bid Food has forty thousand food service customers in Australia, and New Zealand. So it's essentially every aspect of the food service industry, from your white tablecloth hotels to your little cafes to your your aged care facilities, cruise ships, prisons, you know, you name it, the, the, the whole gamut of everything that falls under food service. So under that, um, Bid Food is selling um, about 87,000 different products. So every product you can think of um, that the food service industry needs, uh, both in terms of the food items, but also the non-food items, you yeah. know. Um, in Australia, there's about 50 depots. In mm -hmm. New Zealand, there's 30. Um, so there's, there's a fair number of depots um, serviced with about, about 2,000 staff in Australia, 2,000 staff in New Zealand. You know, so, th so there's, it's, it's quite a, a sizable operation. It's, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, food service operation here in Australia. Robert, is it possible to get a sense of whether it's more economical to install rooftop solar versus buying renewables directly from the grid? There's a lot of variations and variables to that, to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, I think clearly uh, any existing building with solar already on the roof will produce electricity at a cheaper cost than, than buying from the grid. Um, buying renewables from the grid equally is, is, is fantastic. So the real, uh, I think, strategy for us and, and what we're trying to target is how do we get um, solar on roofs yep. to kind of access mm. uh, that piece. And um, much of our, our kind of discussions and planning and, and looking with and talking with our customers is to unlock that. So, mm. you know, from a feasibility point of view, the, the payback on solar is around about four years. Yep. And it, it is reducing and new products are coming out. Um, if you look in Australia, the average lease term is around that five year mark. Yep. So it's a difficult piece to kind of um, you know, fit the puzzle together. Yep. Um, where we've been targeting uh, and especially had a lot of success uh, is speaking with our customers um, and kind of moving, you know, usually a landlord would place uh, some type of rental incentive yep. um, to either encourage uh, leasing of a product or retaining 
um, a customer within the building. We're diverting that from a kind of cash incentive to a capital incentive um, and then implementing and, and placing solar on roofs. Um, that's been very successful. Um, there's a number of, of, of great examples um, in, our, in our portfolio today. Um, you know, the newer developments, it's a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can put them at the construction pace, at, at the time of mm -hmm. construction. But um, yeah, the existing portfolio is, is where we're really targeting. Mark, what are some of the initiatives that Bid Food uses to reduce energy consumption? Is it rooftop solar, purchasing renewable energy, or more emerging efficient refrigeration? The two big, big areas for Bid Food is, is improved refrigeration efficiency um, for definite. You know, there's, there's a big move now across towards the more ammonia based refrigeration plants. But also, you know, following up on Robert's comments, um, rooftop solar as well. Out of the 50 depots here in Australia, I think six have had rooftop solar installed in the last 18 months. Um, in the last 18 months, with a combination of the, the new rooftop solar and improved um, refrigeration plants, rooftop solar has gone up by a million kilowatts a year, mm -hmm. and overall power has come down by 10 million kilowatts a year. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is to do with the ammonia um, refrigeration plants. So that's a 17% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from electricity uh, over, that, over that couple of year period with those two initiatives. Mark, and who measures the energy consumption on a site? You know, is that something bid food does or does a landlord help you out with that as well? It a bit depends. Some of the bid food depots are owned and some of them are leased. So it depends um, you know, on, on, on you know, which depots we're talking about. You know, it's a bit of a mix there. And are there any sort of handy benchmarks <clears throat> that you'd recommend around energy intensity for sort of cold storage versus dry goods storage? I mean, really the benchmarks that Bid Food is looking at is, is measuring its fuel, measuring its electricity, me measuring its refrigeration use, measuring its wastage. You know, so they're the, they're the four big ticket items that, that Bid Food measures and sort of reports against. Um, fuel is obviously an important one because there's 1,200 vehicles running around Australia delivering uh, all this produce to the, to the food service industry. Uh, and as we've just talked about, electricity is important, you know, because all of these depots are freezer stores and chiller stores, as well as storing ambient goods. And what would you ask of your partners, you know, like in, in real estate, you know, the industrial landlords, in terms of how they can help you manage your ESG goals? The main aspects for bid food is, is to have... Um, the right size depot in the right location. So it's about having mid-sized depots um, in all the strategic locations that bid food needs it, rather than relying on a sort of centralized one depot per state sort of model. Mm -hmm. so, so it's about having, having depots of the right size that can do freezer, chiller, ambient uh, in the right locations. Uh, and that's what's going to work for bid food in terms of being able to get product to customers quickly, but also have, have, have those sort of efficiencies, you know, so that's sort of what works. Yep, so bid food is basically mm -hmm. moving, you know, it's locations much closer to, oh, absolute, much closer to absolutely, the Absolutely, you know. Um, obviously in the big cities like Sydney and Melbourne, you have big depots, um, but other than that, it's about location, 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 and getting smaller mid-sized depots out there and more spread out around the country. Uh, and those smaller depots can then service customers better. You've got shorter truck times for your, for your van deliveries um, and having those depots as energy efficient as possible. Does this change your sort of, you know, something that's quite topical is EV strategy. So does this change your EV strategy? Are you bringing... That's, that's a very good question. A bit like the rest of Australia, bid food has probably been a bit slow here in Australia on EVs. If you look at Bid Food UK, Bid Food Europe, Bid Food China, um, they, they've been into EVs for quite a while. Um, but Bid Food Australia is just starting to roll out EVs here in Australia and also looking at options around hybrids. I just shift gears and move to ESG data. Um, Robert, what role does technology play in ESG data capture and analysis? Oh, definitely. Like, data's key. Um, without having the data, it's very hard to you know, set targets 
or and, and manage um, that emission control or, or, or detail. So a lot of our investment in technology is cloud-based um, uh, technology, trying to get data from the buildings. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're at a stage where most of the operational control of a building is actually with the customer. Yep. Um, you know, as Mark indicated, you know, they're, they're running those facilities. So um, for the landlord to try and understand what's occurring within those buildings um, is, is yep. key for us. And that, that is the data. So, you know, we look at data loggers, remove, uh, automate the process, remove that mm -hmm. kind of uh, obligation to supply the landlord with information to try and make an informed decision. Um, you know, that data has you know, three essential goals. You know, one is, is the reporting yep. um, and, and understanding uh, what it is. Um, two is, um, and probably more where we're focused, is, you know, being on a proactive manager, yep. um, trying to kind of pre-predict um, how the maintenance, how do we kind of look after those buildings. Yep. Um, and then the third is, is to work with the customers, like understanding what the emissions are um, and, and where those problems may lie and how we can kind of facilitate. Any interesting sort of tools and you know, techniques that you're experimenting with? Uh, no, nothing of, of, um, that's not widely available. Yep. You know, it's simplicity is probably the key. Yep. Um, and, you know, the big thing is, is about efficiency. Yep. You know, how, how can we implement something that uh, works for all? Yep, yep. And, you know, for the industrial portfolio, um, do you work with Neighbours, Gresby, which of the rating agencies and, and all? Um, well, we work with both. Yep. Um, you know, obviously Neighbours is really the office-related um, side of the business. Yep. Um, we're not there yet in, in, in industrial or logistics. Um, however, you know, market commentary um, is kind of indicating that it is coming and, yep. and something's coming. Um, so part of what we're trying to do is kind of be ahead of the curve. Yep. Um, you know, get that data, understand those buildings before, you know, retrospectively going back and, and trying to kind of meet a regulatory piece. Uh, Gresby, we've been a participant uh, in that for a number of years. Yep. Um, we think it's, you know, it's a good global uh, benchmarking system to understand yep. how a business is managing its assets. Um, and much of what, you know, we try to put in place other than speaking to customers is, you know, what is the outcome from those, uh, that benchmarking results? Where do we need to improve? What do we need to focus on? And, you know, we spoke about this when the two of us caught up, but, you know, what are some of the issues in retrofitting older assets to become more ESG friendly? You know, how, how do you, and, and separately, I guess, how do you incorporate ESG into the development pipeline? Yeah, definitely. Look, the existing buildings is 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 the challenge. Um, they were built at a different time and for a different, I guess, yeah. purpose. You know, the whole future proofing piece um, is probably more of a you know, a current yeah. item as opposed to to those buildings who were built 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah, much of the issue, um, solar panels on roofs, um, is an additional weight that the structure of the building yeah. may never mm. have been designed mm. for. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it doesn't uh, limit the ability to put solar without putting, you know, you can put the structure and, and increase the structure. Um, the electrical side, um, you know, it's the infrastructure around, um, you know, the right cabling, the right distribution boards. Um, natural light, that wellness piece that really, yeah. you know, we didn't care for much uh, in the past in, in, in the industrial asset class. Yeah now takes front of stage yeah you know we want to build healthy sustainable buildings um and that's the easy piece now in terms of putting it into our developments and creating it from the start you know we're more well attuned as to how to future proof that building mark just any um, specific you know technologies and platforms that you found useful for monitoring energy and also just communicating it with your customers um i think from from the first perspective you know, we're a bit ambivalent on whatever what technologies are used, so long as something's there to capture mm. the relevant data. It's more about understanding the KPIs and actually making sure that the correct data for those KPIs is being caught and then can be can be assessed by 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 management and 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 you know determinations made as to whether whether those KPIs are being met and whether you know for future years they should be they should be pushed a bit a bit harder mm. and, and, and a bit more. You know. So, so a bit sort of technology ambivalent when it comes yeah. to, to data collection, just so long as it can be collected, yeah. you know, is how, how I'd 
So, might shift gears and move on to sort of packaging and waste. Um, Robert, you know, waste can be an issue, particularly during reverse logistics. Um, you know, any examples that you can share on work that you're doing with occupiers to manage this type of waste? Yeah, and, and definitely, like again, um, you know, operational control sits with the customer. So again, where can we facilitate or assist yep. uh, in both that? You know, unfortunately, waste is a byproduct of, of the process, um, but you can be creative yep. with, with what it is. Um, we own the perimeter, perimeter warehousing um, at the fresh food market in Melbourne, mm -hmm. for example. Um, there's a, a mass amount of organic waste that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. How do you use it rather than you know, diverting it to landfill? Yeah. Um, you know, it's engaging with the likes of local farms, zoos, mm -hmm. that can actually use that product for, 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 for a better uh, outcome. Um, Amazon's always quoted about the reverse logistics and the problem yeah. uh, they're facing. Um, you know, they'll have their large fulfillment center um, and next door, an equally large yeah, uh, returns business. facility. Um, so it's, it's getting creative in that space. We've got a customer in, in Australia that's in apparel and clothing, um, and they've got a lot of returns, and then that reverse logistics does place pressure on their business. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, seeing them get creative as well, you know, inventing uh, ways um, to kind of get a, a circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, creating a platform for the, instead of returning, you know, those garments back to facility, it may be returning it to another person in the public that yep. uh, also uh, wants to uh, acquire those goods. Um, so yeah, thinking mm -hmm. smarter. Great. Mark, and how do you monitor sort of waste generation at the depots? Biggest waste issues in, in bid foods depots are cardboard, shrink wrap and wood where you get broken pallets. Um, but the, the, the biggest challenge around waste in terms of what we've been doing at Bidfood is not the waste that we generate, but the products that we sell that are going to be somebody else's waste. So in the last couple of years, there's been a big push to move away from things like plastic cutlery, you know, the old-fashioned style, you know, throwaway coffee cups, you know. So so a lot of the, the, the innovation has been in, in Bidfood's products that are going to be somebody else's waste further down the supply chain. Um, you know, coming up with bamboo cutlery, getting rid of plastic straws, you know, getting rid of the old-fashioned sort of foam coffee cups, so that you get, in, you get into um, single-use products that, that are um, biodegradable, you yeah. know. Uh, and so that's been a big, a big push and a big change in products, you know, which is not, not bid foods waste, but the next guy yeah. down the chain's waste, you know. Um, Mark, are these sorts of initiatives something where you can engage with the landlords? You know, can they can they help you out? And the bigger engagement has probably been with social groups. You know, with with with, with some of the community groups. You yeah. know, um, so so yeah, engagement's more been done that way rather than with landlords. With landlords, it's more about you know efficient removal of waste in terms of like you know keeping the cardboard that could go down one particular waste stream aisle separate from other things that, that, that you know, uh, can't, be, can't be, you know, reused, you know. So, so, so it's about having the right, the right sort of, you know, waste distribution networks in your depots. And I'm going to shift gears and, you know, modern slavery has been very topical in, in Australia. Uh, Mark, so how do you identify, you know, risks around modern slavery in, in your supply chain? Very interesting topic, um, especially with legislation here in Australia now. Um, bid food has 3,000 suppliers from all around the globe. So this is a, is a topic we have to be very, very mindful of. Um, bid food has a modern slavery policy and has sort of declarations that all suppliers have to sign and adhere to. So that's sort of step one. Step two is bid food has signed up to uh, an organization called SEDEX that does does these sort of mm -hmm. supply chain audits on modern slavery, you know, so they audit um, high-risk factories. Um, I did quite a lot of work in the home brand side of, of the seafood seafood side of, of bid food, uh, and we have our own internal uh, risk assessment tools um, that we use, and if they flag certain products or certain categories as ones that are going to be high-risk, 
then, then we delve deeper into those supply chains and ask more questions of those particular high-risk suppliers. You know, what are they doing to make sure that there's not problems, you know, uh, in their factories or in the, in the boats that supply their factories? Great. And so most of the partnerships are with companies like ZX? Um, on the modern slavery side, um, the other partnerships tend to be more around sustainability yeah. uh, and environmental management. So we have partnerships with, with the likes of GAA, which is a global aquaculture initiative, MSC, which is the Marine Stewardship Council, ASC, which is the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. We've also been sitting on a committee of uh, the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership, which is another NGO-led organization. We're on their SQUID um, working group looking at issues to do with modern slavery and sustainability of squid in the Pacific. So you need to partner with these various NGO organizations, um, some of whom offer certification schemes so you can have certified product yeah. um, so that you can sort of um, know that you're doing the right thing and, 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 and tick the box and be able to sort of, in some instances, even sort of brand your product with, with you know, certified sustainable products. ESR has a target of at least a 40% female workforce. How are you tracking towards that? We're well advanced um, uh, down the diversity path and, and getting that gender balance. Um, across the group level, we're sitting at 38% um, female workforce. Um, so that the 2025 targets uh, you know, will be done. Like targets are great for kind of keeping, keeping us accountable yep. mm. um, and, and definitely moving past those. Um, you know, the, the importance for us uh, is gender diversity. Um, it's, it, sit as, it sits as at one of our core goals. Um, so, and, and using that diversity in terms of how it kind of benefits uh, the business. Um, unfortunately, the industrial asset class uh, for many years has, has been a male dominated space, um, unlike, you know, the retail and office. Um, and it's actually great to start seeing uh, that, that gender balance um, and it's showing in how we kind of manage and, and, and work with our customers um, by having that kind of, uh, I guess, enhanced, um, I guess, communication uh, through a business and, and, on, and onto our customers. Also, the new distribution centres in Japan feature on-site childcare and canteens. What are some of the on-site features which we might expect in Australia over the next few years? Very innovative uh, designs, uh, and especially with our Japanese business. Um, and again, that goes straight to the core of what the customer wants. Um, group for us is definitely challenging all countries to come up with various initiatives to meet um, their local mm -hmm. uh, social and cultural needs. Um, for us, it's, it's all about designing um, our new estates, um, putting a lot of effort into those, and, and around about um, health and wellbeing. Um, you know, our customers have, have, have been speaking to us around creating 30-minute, um, I guess, health breaks. Um, yeah. So, you know, what do we do in that space? You know, using our biodiversity areas to kind of create, you know, those kind of water-themed parks, you know, walking tracks, running tracks, um, you know, amenities such as basketball courts, um, just for that kind of relief. Um, it's in our food offerings. Um, you know, for the on-site cafes and cafeterias, you know, making sure that, you know, they service what the customer wants. Mm. Um, and again, goes back to that piece of, you know, a better, more efficient operation. Um, it attracts customers, it retains customers. What are some of the strategies that the company is using to focus on employee diversity, both gender and on Indigenous Australians? In a gender context, about a third of the um, staff here in Australia are female, uh, right from the CEO, uh, Rachel Ruggiero, down to people who are driving forklifts, um, a lot of admin staff, a lot of office staff who are in procurement side of things, some people in sales. So, so you know, I, I think they're already doing, doing quite well in that space. You know, there's already a lot, a lot going on there, uh, uh, and, you know, and that's been driven from the top. Uh, in an indigenous sense, um, Bid Food has partnered with Reconciliation Australia and through that partnership is looking at ways to be able to, to better understand how to be able to 
incorporate more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, in, into the bid food workforce. So that's still a work in progress, but there's a partnership there on, on which to build. So, so we look forward to that, that sort of um, giving us some, some positive benefits in the future. Great. I'd like to thank Robert and Mark for what's been a really informative uh, episode. If you like this episode and want to check out more, visit cbre.com.au backslash ESG Fireside Chats and subscribe to be informed of the release of our upcoming episodes. Until next time.